we'll be starting the session in about a minute see you all soon okay Our first fireside chat is In Search of a Story, Lives of Women Journalists, Conversations between Kalpana Sharma and Janvi Sain. Before I hand over the floor to these wonderful women, let me quickly introduce them. Kalpana Sharma is an independent journalist, columnist and author based in Mumbai. In almost five decades as a journalist, specializing in developmental, environmental and gender issues, she has worked with Himmat Weekly, Indian Express, Times of India and The Hindu. She was consulting editor and with the Economic and Political Weekly and Reader's Editor with Scroll.in. Her column on gender, The Other Half, ran for 30 years, first in the Indian Express and then the Hindu. Currently, she writes a media column in Newslaundry.com. We are delighted to have you, Kalpana. Janvi Sen is deputy editor and executive news producer at The Wire. Her focus is on issues related to gender, human rights, and labor. She is the editor of GRIT, the WIRE's special project on manual scavenging and sanitation, and has received a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting for a series of articles on Indian prisons. I would like to hand the floor over to you um, to take the conversation forward. We are really excited. Thanks so much, Seerath. It's really nice to be here. And thank you to Dalberg and the Nudge for organizing this. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to speak to someone like Kalpana who has been in the field for so long and hear about her insights uh, because it's really a landscape that has changed a lot in the time between when she started uh, as a journalist and when I did much more recently. So I think my the first thing I'd like to hear your insights about is just what exactly those changes have looked like. Some of them have been very visible, uh, like the move to more digital journalism. I mean, first the, the sudden boost of TV journalism and now the, the move to, to digital uh, where we see even most newspapers have their own websites and publish different stories uh, depending on which uh, medium they're publishing on. But there have also been other changes. Such, I mean, the business model of the media has always been largely the same, but how that impacts day-to-day -day work and reporting has perhaps changed. So I think what I'd like to get your insight on what has changed and what are the things that you think have remained the same? Uh, are there still certain principles that you think all journalists are adhering to that or were they never there at all? And there was always a sort of spectrum of beliefs and principles that went into it. So that's, I think, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Janavi. And thank you uh, for organizing this. It's uh, very interesting because, you know, we journalists, because we are so busy uh, churning out stuff, we don't actually stop to look back and contemplate about the nature of our profession or these kind of things unless we're like prompted to do so. So for me, this has been an interesting exercise to look back. And uh, Janvi, you and I, of course, are separated not just by, you know, like four score years, um, but um, also the kind of India we live in, you know, the kind of India you were born into, the kind of India I was born into. And I say this because apart from, you know, discussing, say, technology or ownership patterns of the media, uh, very central to journalism is the a political and economic context in which we operate. So I started my journalism in 1972, uh, which next year will be 50 years. And I'm very much the typewriter generation. Um, but it was an India which still had uh, a certain amount of idealism, you know, left over from the Nehru years, even though by that time Indira Gandhi had become all powerful uh, post-1971 and the liberation of Bangladesh. Of course, we did not know then that she would declare a state of emergency in 1975. 
but a lot of power was concentrated in her. Um, and uh, media houses, like now, were still owned by business. And of course, governments, all governments, including from Nehru onwards, had ways of putting pressure uh, on media owners. But um, I'm talking, of course, about the legacy media, because at that point, there was basically print. Um, there was still this dividing line between editorial and management, you know. And management did not encroach on editorial or vice versa. And uh, these business owners would appoint really strong editors who became names in their own right and whose writing was um, uh, read with co you know, considerable attention by policymakers and by politicians. And so in that sense, it's a very marked difference from what we have today, where, again, even if you just look at print, there are hardly any editors of that kind you know, left because the management has taken over even the role of deciding what should be content, you know, that lovely word content, which I hate uh, because that's not what uh, is defined as journalism. So I think we have to think about the changes in journalism over the last 50 years uh, within that political context. And I think it began to change in the 90s when, um, you know, uh, media was seen much more as a profit center. And it started with one group, the Times of India group, which defined it as such, and other groups followed. But I think that's what changed our lives as journalists also. Because even if we came into journalism with certain kind of idealism, and in a sense, your and my journey is very similar in that sense, because you, you're with The Wire, which has certain values for which it stands. I started my career with a small magazine called Himmat Weekly, uh, which was founded by Raj Mohan Gandhi, Gandhiji's grandson. All of us were there with that sense that we had to do something, you know, for the country. As journalists, we had to contribute by exposing what was wrong and speaking truth to power. I know these are all cliches, but that was truly our motivation. And because it was a small setup, you got a chance to do the things that you wanted to do. And you had editors who were fair minded and, you know, democratic. That is not the case once you enter mainstream media. So, um, so let me stop there because I think we can discuss more whether technology also affects the quality of our journalism and uh, what we do. Yeah, definitely. And uh, a lot of what, what you said is fascinating. And I think one of the things that I would pick up from there is uh, you, you said about how your journey also changed from when you were at Himmat to then when you went to more mainstream publications. Uh, do you think Work, how different do you think working in one of those mainstream publications then would be to now? Because what you said about the smaller publications, say Himmat and of that day and the wire of today, you seem to suggest that the experience would be somewhat similar, though of course not identical. Yes. Uh, but do you think it's in the mainstream where that would have changed substantially? Uh, uh, even in the mainstream, I think it has changed. Because see, when I joined, my first paper was in Indian Express, the daily newspaper. And Mr. George Verghese was the editor. And um, I was one of the first, I think probably, I was the second woman who was appointed as an assistant editor. There had been somebody before me who had retired. And, uh, but, you know, Mr. Verghese did not have any kind of fixed things about what I could write and what I couldn't write. If I suggested a subject, I could write it, whether it was on science or environment or developmental issues, which were my issue or gender. When I joined was when the women's movement, the autonomous women's movement was coming in, into its own. So I suggested we must have an edit on the 8th of March, you know. And to his credit, Mr. Verghese accepted that that was a relevant thing on which a mainstream newspaper must comment, you know. Yeah. So I think those kind of things are not here now, you know. And similarly with news, for instance, uh, in the early 80s was when we first began to get news about dowry debts, you know, what are called dowry debts today. But they came as just small news items showing that newly wedded women were dying in these mysterious kitchen fires. Now, the Indian Express commissioned uh, its crime reporter and a senior woman journalist to together do a series of articles where they followed up on each and every one of these, you know, uh, so-called uh, deaths. And they ran it as front page anchor, you know, and those are all editorial decisions that are made not based on your market or who's going to like it or not like it or whether the government will like it or not like it. It is it's journalism. It what should be done. 
Similarly, at that time, we had a full-time developmental correspondent. We had a full-time environmental correspondent. You know, where are these people anymore? The Hindu, for instance, for years had a labor correspondent, an agriculture correspondent. All these areas that were considered completely legit for us as journalists to cover have gone out because now news has been defined as what sells your product. So then your market is what decides what is the content of what you produce, you know? So yeah. people living in Bombay are not interested in floods in Bihar or poverty. So we won't write about it. That's the argument being made. Yeah. And, I, and like you said, these positions that uh, in many organizations now no longer exist. I think what we've also seen over the last few years, at least since I have been working in the media, is there seems to be sort of a constant churn that is blamed largely on financial crises in media houses, uh, where we often see large scale layoffs, uh, a lot of job insecurity. We saw it even before COVID and then of course, a very large amount of it during the last year and a half. And I, I suppose I'm wondering how that was in the in the period. Like I think you mentioned that job insecurity was not as much of an issue, even it, if it was com completely different. You know, because yeah. we were called working journalists. I mean, we worked <laughs> and we were journalists. Yeah. But there, there was actually a law called the Working Journalists Act, and so all of them, all of us who were employed, were employed under the Working Journalists Act, uh, which gave us job security. We could not be just hired and fired at the will of the management. The management had to show cause why they wanted a particular journalist uh, to be uh, sent off. And the journalist had the right to uh, appoint a lawyer and argue it out in labor court. And so I think that provide, and of course, salaries were pitiful. They were very low. And we were in these grades, you know, just a bit like a government office, where if you were an assistant editor, you were in that grade of assistant editor. You couldn't get anything more. Whatever was already decided under the Working Generous Act. So actually, in many ways, it also benefited the employers because they knew that they had this vast workforce yeah. at really very low salaries. But unions were not welcome, though all of us were unionized. And uh, that is the thing that began to change in the 90s because then you get started getting these individualized contracts. So mm -hmm. there was more money and therefore obviously tempting for most journalists to go in for it. But it also meant that there was no guarantee that you had the job. You know, at one month's notice, you could be sacked, and without reason, you couldn't challenge it. And uh, the unions just disappeared. You know, there were journalist unions, so to speak. Uh, 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 there is still a Delhi Union of Journalists and a Bombay Union of Journalists, but they have no impact on individual journalists who are sacked without reason. So at the moment, with this COVID, the yeah. number of journalists who have lost their jobs literally overnight. You know, yeah. entire editions of newspapers being closed and people asked to leave um, and asked to submit resignations, you know, because then uh, uh, the management doesn't want to say they're sacked. I mean, this kind of thing could not have happened up to the 90s, where still the majority of journalists were under the Working Journalists Act. Yeah, as was uh, related to what you said about unions and how they would take up uh, the cases of individual journalists who were sacked. I'm wondering at a time when there weren't that as many women journalists, as you said, uh, that you know you were maybe the second at a certain level of seniority. Uh, were these unions involved in creating an environment that would help more women join the media? Or no, I no, <laughs> I don't think that entered the conversation at all. You mm -hmm. know, I th you know, in the English language press, um, you know, it's not just gender, but we have to think about both class and caste. Absolutely. So I think because the salaries were low, uh, but yet it, it was a profession with some kind of profile, it happened that especially in the English language press, it was usually uh, women with a certain amount of social capital um, uh, who joined, you know, and they did very well. I mean, they were well educated. And even if there were just a few, most of them did very well in the profession. Um, it's only once, uh, and but in the regional language press, actually, the situation was very different. There were hardly any women. And by the way, even in the English language press, the majority of women were on the desk. There were hardly any in reporting. And those who were in reporting had a very difficult time arguing to be able to do the beats that they felt uh, they wanted to do. You know, they were basically shoved to health, women and child welfare, etc. But say you wanted to do the crime beat uh, in the city.
or if you were based in Delhi, you wanted to do politics, you wanted to do defense, even sports. You know, Sharda Ugra, who's now the best known uh, sports journalist, I wouldn't even say woman yeah. sports journalist, uh, she was one of the first uh, to start writing on sport. I mean, when she joined the Hindu, she was the only woman uh, writing on sport in the Hindu. Uh, I'm talking about the 90s. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, unions were not interested in, in gender equality. And, uh, but some branches of unions were. I mean, like in the Bombay Union of Journalists, there were a group of women journalists who actually fought for women to be able to do night shifts because they argued mm. that unless women can do night shift, the one who are on the desk, they will never be able to uh, make a bid to be uh, the chief sub, you know, who's the person in charge of the desk. Uh, because they'll say, you don't have the experience of putting the paper to bed, what's called putting the paper to bed. And uh, they really fought hard that the management should arrange either transport or should arrange some place where they could rest so that they could take the first train back in the morning. And uh, it wasn't easy because it was not accepted. You know, uh, when I joined um, the Hindu, uh, most of the women uh, employed there who were again on the desk all left work by about six, seven o'clock in the evening. You know, there was nobody around late in the night. So I think these things did not change because of the management. It was because yeah. either women formed uh, groups and fought about it. Or in some cases, the the uh, uh, you know the unions intervene, but very few cases actually. Mm -hmm. Some of what you have said is, is still visible in newsrooms today. Um, that I mean, there are a lot of women reporters now, but in many cases, the desks are still largely uh, manned, so to say, by women. Also, the features, uh, features sections, yes, I must tell you. That, yeah. Too, yeah, yeah. So, the like Sunday magazine or you yeah, know, any yeah. of those, those would always be mainly women. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing we saw, um, especially over the last year, is how many of the health reporters are women. Correct. And maybe it was sold as a soft beat, but then it's, it's I mean, there isn't, I, I would like to say there's no such thing as a soft beat, really. And, but so many of them have done such remarkable work over the last year. But, the fact that largely they were women working only in the health beat still says something about how beats are distributed um, even today. And yeah, uh, in fact, we had a we had a discussion once where we were arguing that actually the hard beats are the ones where you require much harder work. So you know, environment, developmental issues, health, all these can't be done sitting at a desk. You have to get out, yeah. and you have to take some risks also when you go out. Whereas when you're on a political beat, you can just call up your sources, you know, and file your copy sitting in the office. You don't actually have to go anywhere or hop knob with them in the Central Hall of Parliament or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the same with the business reporting, you know, it's just meeting a few important people. But the real, uh, I mean, like the stories that are the nuts and bolts of, you know, what, what we call journalism, which is getting out or covering crisis, you know, uh, natural disasters or riots. Yeah. Those are things that, that are really hard work. So they should be considered yeah. the hard beats and not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, but um, the thing about the desk being largely women in many cases, it's, uh, it's complicated to decide who, who where that responsibility lies because it is a definitely a much more backstage role, especially now when bylines are, I think, much more prominent than they used to be uh, earlier in just legacy media houses and in the newspapers, where often there were no bylines in most cases. Mm. Uh, as now, I think, especially with the online media, bylines are much more prevalent. And journalists also have their own uh, sort of personal followings on social media and such. When, and obviously, on the desk, you wouldn't have any of that. And I suppose I, it's intriguing to think where that distinction happens is it in the application process itself where it's sort of uh, a self-selective process or is it that uh, managers think women will be able to will do these jobs better and won't necessarily want the limelight i think it's a combination of the two i mean yeah. i think uh, a lot of women who've done uh, journalism self-select because by the time they get to the point of a job maybe they're already married or, or if they, even if they're single, they feel um, inhibited in terms of, you know, reporting has this thing about 
you don't have any hours, you don't know when you'll be sent out. And so they're a bit uh, hesitant about taking on something like that. So it's usually those, uh, at least my experience with dealing with uh, uh, women who go into reporting, is they were clear from the start that that's what they wanted to do. So even if some of them joined the desk, because that was the thing that was available at that point to get your toe in, they pushed uh, to do stories and finally were recognized as, as fit to be reporters and given reporting jobs. Or they would have to leave the organization they were working for and uh, pitch to join some other organization where they would get a chance to report. You know, So it's a bit of that. And I think my own observation was that things changed a lot in around the mid 80s latter part of the 80s when uh, both the telegraph which at that point had started a delhi edition uh, their bureau in delhi was entirely women i think there was one man mm -hmm. and they were covering all the you know major uh, punjab right. kashmir all the ministries etc and hindustan times at that point I, kushwan singh was the editor and I recall that he hired, uh, you know, there were reporter vacancies. And overnight, a friend of mine who worked there said, suddenly the newsroom was almost 50% women. And these women were just the brightest who applied. And so they got the job. But I think the third thing we must remember is, you know, because journalism was never a highly paid profession, uh, many men who even if they wanted to write, uh, either deferred joining till they had got some high degree so they could come in laterally uh, at the editorial position mm. um, or went into other professions, you know, did MBAs. And for them, you know, the money part of it was more important than being journalists. It's only mm. when journalism became a better paying profession that you found uh, many more men. But even till today, if you go to journalism schools, the majority are yeah. women who are in the schools. And I think, again, because of this thing of the pay factor, because I think, you know, it's not a hugely paying profession, even today, yeah. even though it's 100% better than what it was when I started. And the, the sort of class and caste divide that you mentioned earlier, uh, that when you joined, it was only women from a certain, uh, some certain social categories who were coming to these jobs for various reasons. Do you see that as being different now? Uh, you know, I don't think any detailed surveys have been done. Yeah. But there was a survey done, I think, if I recall, about 15 years ago um, and maybe 10 years ago. And even then, uh, in the English language press, uh, uh, the number of Dalits, for instance, was like you could literally count on the fingers of your hand. Yeah, I think and, more recent, even anecdotal reports say similar Yeah, say things. the same. Yeah. And as far as women is concerned, of course, it's changed hugely. Uh, first, because of television which took in a lot of women, including in reporting. And many of them became very prominent, but also backroom as you, we were discussing. You know, there were a lot of women who were uh, even behind the camera and the editing and so on. Um, and then the digital, you know, much more. Uh, but even today, the latest data that I have is that in India, uh, the number of female journalists is only 23.5% of the total, mm -hmm. which is really small. And yeah. of, of these, only 14% are in top management positions. Yeah. So, you know, even in terms of just moving up, that I think has not changed. I think most yeah. owners are far more comfortable with having a man in the top position. They don't mind having the women at the secondary or th third level or whatever. But yeah. the, the number one person, they prefer as a man. And how has that affected women who have now, like you, been in the sector for so many years? Uh, since people of my generation would not have yet hit that point where they come yeah. to that ceiling where you feel like well, no matter what you do, you can't really get any further. Uh, you know, the thing is, um, a lot of the time, especially if you're interested in writing on certain issues and you have a passion to make sure that you get the chance to write those things, um, then even if you have that ambition, I mean, all of us have an ambition. I would also like to be the editor of a newspaper. Yeah. Um, if you're with an organization that gives you that space uh, to be able to write on those issues, then I think many women uh, like me, or with my kind of motivation for coming into journalism, um, are happy with that. Because, you know, the thing is, mainstream has a huge reach. You can work with an alternative paper and you can write whatever you like. But the reach mm -hmm. is limited. Mm -hmm. if, if a mainstream newspaper like Indian Express did with Mr. Verghese and the Hindu did when I worked with it, I had this column on gender every fortnight, you know, which ran way after I even retired from the Hindu. Um, 
And the Hindu, uh, the editor was very open to suggestions on series on something, on writing about areas, the Northeast, for instance, uh, the Hindu paid a lot of attention to and a lot of reporting was encouraged from there. And uh, writing about poverty, writing about developmental programs that weren't working, um, I, environmental issues, you know, a lot of things. So I think if you find that kind of uh, paper, even if there are always problems, I mean, there are no perfect place. I think a lot of us would settle for it. And I know that, again, in the 80s, a lot of women opted out of working full time. Uh, in ma many senior women uh, for reasons of family, maybe they had children at that time and they couldn't or they had, you know, were caregivers, uh, but they continue to write and they're still uh, names and, you know, well known because that early work that they had done already as in reporting uh, stood them in good stead. So you still have columnists, you know, of that generation who are writing in many uh, newspapers uh, because they have such a wealth of knowledge already gathered. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the period that they reported. But uh, it is frustrating, you know, to think we're in 2021 and even today, no national English language newspaper has a woman editor. Major, I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. if, if there has been a woman editor, she's a member of the family who owns the paper. So it's not like women who have started with reporting and worked their way up to senior positions uh, the mm -hmm. way you see in the US and other places. It has not happened. And uh, I think it's the same in regional language. Minal Pandey was one of the exceptions when she became editor of Hindustan. Yeah. And uh, I know in Kannada, there was a woman called Purnima who was editor of one of the Kannada papers. And there may have been a few handful, you know, there's yeah. Patricia Mukhim who's editor of Shillong yeah. Times. Uh, but, you know, you can literally like pick out the women who are there and there are lots yeah. of publications and papers. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, after all those years of working at the end of it, you don't get that position. I mean, that is a thing. That is a fact. Yeah. yeah. So whether whether you feel at the end of it, your life has been wasted or not, that is up to each individual. I don't feel my life was wasted just because I didn't get up to that position of what yeah. I would have liked. But, you know, I'm very happy that I had the chances I did have, uh, especially uh, in the latter part in Hindu and the earlier part in the Indian Express, mm. uh, as far as mainstream media is concerned. And that I could yeah. stick to my own convictions and the uh, principles that I believed in, you know, in terms of what I write and the, the standards I had set for myself, I could adhere to them even though I was within a mainstream newspaper. Yeah. Uh, we have two questions from the audience as well. One is, uh, how friendly is journalism as a profession to persons across gender identities? Do you want Shall to go? I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I would say, you know, it's much like I would probably other development sector organizations as well that have been speaking here that uh, s slowly perhaps spaces are becoming uh, more welcoming and conversations are changing. And I think even in terms of how such issues are covered and language used, which is such a big part of the media, Things are slowly changes, changing, but it is a slow change. Uh, it's definitely, I wouldn't say that it would be the easiest experience. Like at some point it probably, it hasn't been for women and in several places, especially in vernacular media, it still isn't. And there still is a lot of discrimination. And that probably would be, this, would be the same as well. So I think, yeah, it's hard to say that it's definitely very welcoming. At least I wouldn't say that, but I also wouldn't say that there isn't any sort of slow change. I do think these conversations have started and as they become more prominent in civil society, in in other in other spheres, that does transfer to the media as well. Yeah, I think when I was full time in journalism, um, uh, you know, the issue was uh, uh, women, you know, I don't yeah. think these other issues that have come uh, lately were addressed and I will not be in a position to say whether uh, media organizations today are sensitive to that or not. But as I've explained about women, I mean, women journalists who are on the job uh, still had to face um, a lot of hurdles in even getting the kind of assignments they wanted unless they were lucky. And as I said, the English language press was an outlier. You know, when you think of the whole of the Indian press, you really have to think of the Indian language. And our conversations, my conversations with some uh, women who were writing in say, Telugu or uh, in Andhra Pradesh or Telangana, they told me, I mean, there's 
salaries, what they were earning, this I'm talking about the 2000 and later, was shocking compared to what we were paid. They were not even designated as journalists, you know, um, even though they were doing all the jobs that were journalists. So that's the kind of difference between, uh, yeah. and that's only because they were women, you know, they were sort of not only in the desk, but they were just not considered journalists. They were given some other designation altogether. So mm -hmm. I think that struggle is still going on. I don't think it's completely over yet. Right. Uh, leave alone, they, yeah. Yeah, the amount of payment also, even now to stringers in uh, smaller areas is still very yeah. different from what journalists in metropolitans and larger cities make. Yeah. Even though the work they do is uh, the same and perhaps even harder given the circumstances. Uh, another question from the audience is, in what ways have mentorship for women changed? Well, uh, speaking for myself, I would say um, hugely. Uh, again, I was very lucky uh, because I started with a small magazine and I had a very good editor uh, who was also a mentor. I had also somebody who really taught me how to edit copy, you know, patiently in the typewriter uh, age. You gave typed copy and this person would bracket all the extraneous words and ask me to go back and retype it and read it myself. And I would see what a difference it makes to be able to write clear and clean copy without a whole lot of words. You know, the trouble is yeah. the way we are taught English language in our schools is full of adjectives and all which we have to like right. wash our brains out when we get into journalism and get rid yeah. of all of that. But um, and up to, I think, um, Indian Express, as I said, Mr. Verghese was a terrific editor. You know, he would brief me before I went out on any assignment. He would ask me to come and debrief and tell him everything. We would discuss what stories I would do out of that time away. Um, and from, uh, I don't see that happening. It had already stopped when I was in journalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it happens now. Uh, I think it would be a rare uh, thing in mainstream particularly for any younger journalist to get that kind of mentorship. But Janavi, you would be in a position to say. Uh, yeah, I think perhaps one of the big changes is that from when we start out, we see so many more um, successful women journalists who have been doing amazing work for so many years, which perhaps when if you were starting much many decades ago, then you wouldn't have that, which which is different from mentorship, but it does uh, show you what the possibilities are. And I suppose you you don't have to assume that there are things you can't do or won't be allowed to do. Uh, you go in there thinking that you can do most things that perhaps you would like to, which which would be one change. But yeah, in terms of otherwise mentorship, as Kalpana said, my perspective is from a very small organization, uh, which would work differently. But uh, I, I don't know if there's any specific mentorship for women journalists as opposed to journal, like all journalists in general, but I do think that in small organizations when you have easier access to editors, there are fewer people, the conversations are between say 30, 35 people, so everyone is talking to each other. The mentorship challenge is not as big as perhaps if you're in a very large organization, you're starting in a small bureau where you don't really get to talk to anyone except your immediate um, superior. Uh, we have a, now, I think, a few more questions now that we've started taking these. Yeah. Uh, someone is asking me about finance scavengers and sanitation workers doesn't seem like a soft beat. What was your experience reporting on that? Well, I think, um, yeah, like I said before, I don't really think there are soft beats in reporting. Um, if you're using the same sort of diligence and uh, you have the same attitude to all your stories, then it's really a matter of what interests you and where you end up and the kind of uh, sources and relationships you develop. And at least for me, it was a, a very interesting and um, I, I don't think it was very different from other reporting experiences. I, if, I don't think if I were to say be uh, reporting on elections or something which is not really my field of interest and not something I have really followed up on. Uh, but it, as in terms of what I would be doing as a reporter, I don't see it as uh, very different in the day-to-day -day work that goes into it. So yeah, it, it was a, it was very interesting experience for me because that is what I wanted to do. Uh, but in terms of as a soft beat or not, like I said, I don't think uh, the work that went into it 
was definitely quite hard and uh, took a lot of effort but i think so would have most other stories if done the right way uh there's one for you kalpana about what surprises you about journal sorry did you want to respond no no something? what was that what surprises you about journalism today ha huh. what surprises me lots of things <laughs> first of all uh, much of what is done in the name of journalism is not journalism and i never thought that in my lifetime i'd reach a point where it's almost embarrassing to say i'm a journalist uh, and i'm talking of course specifically about television which uh, news uh, where there's no news first of all it's only opinion and uh, you know this this uh, category of these talk shows that have just occupied prime time on television is really it's shocking i mean i don't know of anywhere in the world where you have the majority of your uh, mainstream news channels doing what they do in india and this is what people are watching and therefore uh, the fact that journalism and uh, news is supposed to give primarily information on the basis of which people can form an opinion but in india it's the other way around you're given opinions you know undiluted and all kinds of extremes without the basis of information and even the information that is given is often fake information and so i think it is it is one of the lowest points uh, of journalism but on the other hand what surprises me is that despite this um and despite the fact that so much of mainstream media including print is now so much um under pressure from both government and business because of the economics of mainstream media you can't survive either with advertising and now with the economy in the state it's in you're not getting the advertising from the private sector so you have to depend on advertising from the government uh, the way it used to be maybe you know four decades earlier which means you tow the government line if you want 21 pages from yogi adityanath you know in one magazine like had was uh, you tow the line you don't go too far that despite it you still find that journalists are breaking stories and coming out you know and uh, and many of these are independent journalists freelance journalists Absolutely. who often at very low amounts uh, just because they feel passionately that those things must be written about go out and investigate and write about it and of course they pay a huge price because many of them have cases against them uh, including defamation sedition and now uapa you know uh which is the terror mm -hmm. law is being used against journalists there's a young woman in kashmir masrat zehra who's one of the few women photojournalists in india done fantastic work you know in a conflict situation and she's landed up getting a uapa case case against her why because her pictures are exposing what is really going on in kashmir so mm -hmm. i think you know the kind of you know we still have the semblance of a democracy we don't have the emergency like we had the emergency which i lived through in 75 to 77 and uh, and so a journalist would go in thinking you know i can do i can write about these things i can take these pictures but the reality is otherwise and many news organizations actually don't stand up for the journalists who face this so out of their own money they have to go continuously make court appearances so you know despite that kind of political atmosphere and despite the fact that the owners of many publications do not back their journalists who do these kind of excellent stories the fact that journalists are still doing that gives me great hope because it means there's generation after generation of journalists who are still coming in uh, with the commitment that their job is to speak to through power to unearth what is going on in the country and to report it as fairly and as in depth as is possible to do and i think as long as that spirit stays alive uh, you know one need not despair completely yeah okay there's one question that i'm supposed to ask you janvi oh, okay uh, which is um uh yeah what question would i have for the new generation of journalists in the sense i've answered it but i want to ask you i mean i mm. teach journalism occasionally and uh, i am always surprised when i ask uh, the first question i ask is how many of you read a newspaper this morning mm. and of course in a class of 50 like three hands will go up <laughs> because yeah. nobody nobody of your generation reads newspapers you get it all on your phone yeah uh, but uh, you know these things that i'm saying that you know the passion and the feeling that i had when i wanted to be a journalist do you feel that your generation there are many who still come into it or do they think of it as another profession maybe a little glamorous and that is why they choose 
to go in for media studies mm-hmm. and thereafter to become journalists i think there's definitely both but i would say that i see a lot of interest in people in really wanting to do the kind of journalism that we're talking about the kind of that you know, really trying to find the stories that are affecting so many people that maybe don't necessarily ha- now have the kind of uh, space for publication that they once did uh, but yeah I, i do see a lot of that I, every time we have an opening at the yo we see a very large amount of interest uh, in any kind of position and uh, i think the it's hard to say that people are just looking at it as a profession because in some sense the dangers have increased uh like like you said the uap cases and things that's not something you would necessarily have imagined a few decades ago i, I would believe uh or the uh, the relevant law data so i think there is definitely the passion um that still very much exists and that is why we're still getting great stories from across the country and of course there is there is the notion that it's glamorous but on most days it's really not that no. glamorous at all and it's uh, it can be very frustrating and there's a lot of waiting and <laughs> so um yeah i think i don't i don't think the that if you were living on the need for glamour that this would sustain you for very long uh especially in in maybe in some newsrooms but not in most so i do think that for a large number of people it still is uh, a belief in wanting to do something and then whether or not you're able to do it obviously it also then depends on the publication you end up in and all of that but i do think that idealism still does uh, still does exist and i think sirat is here to tell us that we are out of time <laughs> uh, as much as i would love for both of you to continue uh, we aren't sure opportunity to start the next session again but it was lovely having both of you um and looking at how much journalism has changed almost to the extent that it's no longer journalism and access to women has increased but yet there continue to be so many similarities and i think what kalpana you said on um, how there was some idealism during your time i only hope that that idealism continues to exist for change to take place um but thank you so very much um and we hope to have you again on some other panel soon um thank you thank you great our next session is uh, championing others rights and their own we'll have two la- lawyers who led the 377 case um we'll be on it in a couple of minutes too, so please do stay put thank you